Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in game as well. Now in these videos I like to take your suggestions that you leave for me down in the comment section below in all of these videos of monsters that you'd like to see me draw, monsters you'd like to see me cover and research the lore and history of. And I add them to a to draw list and then I hand that to draw list over to my patrons over on Patreon who, whether they tip me the price of a cup of tea every single month all the way up to the very very highest level levels will get an equal vote on the order in which I do things. But seeing as it's December, and seeing as I get very very excited this time of year, I'm a big fan of Christmas, I thought instead of selecting purely from all of the suggestions that you guys have made, I thought today I'm going to be talking about dragons, specifically about chromatic dragons. And this concept was first suggested, well, by all of you, really. So, so many people want to see dragons of one kind or another, and I totally, totally get it. They are unbelievably cool creatures, but there's just so much to cover with them. So I've decided to split up as much dragon-based stuff as I possibly can into the whole of December and start a celebration that we will call Dragon December, because I won't even be able to cover everything dragon-related in a month. We'll have to come back to dragons next year as well if you guys like this idea. So please make sure to leave a little thumbs up down below. If this is something that you do like, make sure to leave a little comment so I know next year if you would like to do the same thing again. But with that out of the way, we should get started with today's video. So as I say, there is an absolute ton of stuff to cover in this video in the topic of dragons in general. So I have decided to make this video about chromatic dragons purely, and I'll be covering them in as much detail as I can get away with, but even while I was writing the notes for this video for, for talking to you guys and after doing all my research, this is probably going to be one of my very longest videos, so I will have to gloss over quite a lot of stuff and hope Hopefully I'll be able to come back and probe into more in depth into more specific matters at another time. So today I'm going to be drawing and talking about chromatic dragons specifically. So with a name like Dungeons and Dragons I'm sure it'll surprise no one to hear that chromatic dragons first appeared in the original white box set in 1974. They've been around since the whole game has been a thing. They are integral to the game and these six limbed beasts have a number of influences in real world mythology but there is one key thing to get out of the way before we talk about everything else in terms of their influences, and that is that the dragons of D&D universally have six limbs. They have arms, legs, and wings, all separate, as opposed to many representations. For example, uh, let's say the giant flying lizards in Game of Thrones that Daenerys Targaryen rides, which with two winged arms and two legs, are much more like the anatomy of a reptilian bat and would be considered cousins of wyverns, perhaps, in Dungeons & Dragons terminology. But wyverns are a video for another day. In D&D, we have three different types of dragons. Although various books and homebrews allow for thousands of different persuasions, the standard editions and canon, I guess, afford us three main kinds. The evil chromatic dragons, the good-aligned metallic dragons, and the somewhat neutrally aligned gemstone or crystal dragons, although only two of these are found in 5th edition's Monster Manual. As for the crystal dragons, I'd highly recommend looking at Matthew Coville's Strongholds and Followers books. They're absolutely brilliant, brilliant read. I would say potentially, depending on how you play, an essential read to get more out of the game, but they definitely include these other dragons that appeared in previous editions and are, well, I think they enhance the game. So definitely check that out if you are a fan of collecting the other books and you are looking for more stuff to throw at your players that's not just in the monster manual and so on. But today's chromatic dragons were largely inspired by medieval European sort of legends in which dragons tend to be horrifying forces of nature or works of the devil perhaps, a villain to overcome. The word dragon in European mythology is that of evil. Even Dracula, son of the dragon, Dragulia, was synonymous with devil. So dragons and devils are innately tied in mythology. Most depictions of dragons began as serpents, evil and sometimes enormous snakes or worms, hence why dragons are sometimes called worms, 
W-Y-R-M-S, maybe Wyrms, I guess. I say it Worms, I don't know how you do. Spelled similarly, similarly to Wyverns, Western dragons can largely trace their ancestry back to Indo-European folk stories and Middle Eastern mythology. Mushkushu, an ancient Mesopotamian lion serpent, might be our very earliest reference. Apophis, an ancient Egyptian serpent god of chaos, an opponent of light. Vrita, the personification of drought in Vedic traditions, also sometimes called dragon in Hinduism. The sea monster Leviathan in the Bible and Hebrew mythology. Mythology. And of course, Jormungandr, the world serpent, Fafnir, and Nidhogr, the serpent who gnaws at the roots of the world tree in Norse mythology. They're all very fitting origins for what we in the West know as modern dragons. In fact, the word dragon literally means massive serpent or sea fish in ancient Greek, a word that will be adopted into the English language after spending a bit of time in old France. It went on holiday. But the closest relative to our D&D chromatic dragons likely comes from the tale of Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon story of a hero's life, who, on his journeys, encounters many great and terrible creatures, the last of which is his nemesis, the deadly, fire-breathing dragon. This story importantly adds the detail that this dragon hoards treasure, going so far as to burn several towns to ash after a slave creeps into its lair and steals a bejeweled cup. In retaliation for the onslaught, Beowulf, the legendary hero, becomes a dragon slayer, a feature which will become strongly associated with heroes thereafter, including England, the land of my birth. Our patron saint is Saint George, who famously slew a dragon. It's a story that dates back to the 13th century and set the standards for knights and their legends, their myths throughout the Middle Ages. But really, it was the story of Beowulf in particular that gave us the kind of D&D dragons, because the story caught the eye of obscure Anglo-Saxon scholar who some of you may have actually heard of. His name was J.R.R. Tolkien, and he apparently wrote some sort of fan fiction called uh, The Hobbit, featuring an original character dragon, heavily inspired by Beowulf's dragon, known as Smaug, a great red dragon, a fire breather obsessed with wealth and hoarding treasure. Apparently it's even been made into a film or two in 2012, directed by the guy who made uh, Heavenly Creatures. Weird, but then I don't watch many indie films. For those of you exploding into a fiery tempest like the dragons in this video, in the comment section, don't worry, I'm just messing. But it was this concept of adversarial dragons, winged serpents, Smaug, the treasure hoarder, all of this heroic imagery of overcoming and slaying dragons, which inspired the chromatic dragons of D&D. So when Gary Gygax wrote them into the game, they needed to be as adversarial as possible. As a result, chromatic dragons are dominated by greed, a sense of superiority, viewing moral creatures as little more than fodder, or at best, perhaps pack animals, whose worship and devotion plays into their endless, endless scheming. And scheme, I think, is the word of the day when it comes to chromatic dragons. They're breathtakingly intelligent, being roughly as smart as an adult human from the moment that they hatch from their eggs, and then only go on to grow in both size, power, and intellect during their seemingly endless lives. By the time a dragon has lived six years, it's roughly the size of a horse, well, maybe even a shire horse, something larger than that. They reach adulthood by the time they are 100 years old, quite a bit like elves, I guess, and they're already twice the size of the average giraffe by that time. But when they reach their full size, their enormous stature, when they are ancient dragons, which is around the time they are 800 to 1000 years old, they are three times that tall. Keep in mind a giraffe is actually the tallest known animal on earth, so that's actually a pretty horrifying creature to bear down on you, even before you take into account their massive claws, jagged teeth, and genius intelligence. Now just like the stories that inspired them, dragons are hoarders in D&D, and they hoard for the sake of hoarding. They have no intention of parting with any of their gold or items that they sequester away in their lairs, but they develop a ruinous paranoia revolving around the fear that people will steal from them. And of course, my eyes are fixed firmly on the halfling burglar of the party right now. You know what you did. But this paranoia leads them to make their homes and thus hide their hordes in hard to reach and dangerous environments, which they may fill with elaborate traps using their extensive knowledge of spellcraft and may even employ magically imbued guardians or even utilize their inherent 
awe-inspiring presence to cultivate a following of worshippers, a cult who could even ward off intruders on their behalf, or even bring them even more treasure as offerings. Interestingly, they genuinely want to keep adventurers out of their homes for the most part. Some may make homes that humanoids can enter so that they can torture these lesser beings, but mortal intelligent creatures are so small and provide so little fuel for these things, by comparison to a dragon, that a small party would barely really make a meal for even a slightly peckish dragon. Now, I'm trying to think of the closest approximation for a sense of scale, but I think if we go for an adult T-Rex, which is said to have needed to eat around 40,000 calories per day, which it could easily consume if it ate something the size of a human easily. Humans apparently contain 110,000 calories of energy, but a T-Rex would have stood at about 40 feet tall. So a fully grown dragon, who's nearly twice that tall, as well as having an extra set of limbs to contend with, and a boiling breath weapon to fuel, and the massive energy consuming brain in their skulls on top of all of that, regularly needs to eat a herd of sheep, or a few horses to be sated for even a day, and it would probably rather devour a town's livestock rather than encouraging people to discover its precious treasure. The different colours of chromatic dragons behave very, very differently as well. They crave different things to store in their hordes, and they make their homes in different places, all of which are usually pretty incredibly deadly. Black dragons are the most aggressive and generally putrid of the chromatic dragons. They have faces that resemble a draconic skull, whose surface is thinly coated in obsidian flesh, stretched tight to show sunken eyes and a crown of jagged horns. Rather than finding humanoids and mortals simply a nuisance, or perhaps more like vermin, black dragons actively hate these creatures, seeing their prosperity as a personal insult to them. As a result, they will actively seek out any humanoids they can find and revel in their suffering. If they can absolutely resist the urge to slaughter the weakest of the group first for a quick ego boost and reaffirmation of their strength, they'll try and leave at least one survivor to torture, waiting only for them to beg and plead for their lives or perhaps their deaths, all of their cries of anguish sustaining the black dragon, before they will finally end the humanoid's suffering. Dwelling most frequently in bogs and fetid swamps, black dragons like to make their lairs in dank cave systems filled with ankle-high stagnant water, which often stinks of the rot of decaying corpses and vegetation that litter their homes, a putrid fragrance that the black dragon itself is also shrouded in. Within their foul lairs, they gather the ancient treasure of long-forgotten civilizations as monuments to fallen mortal civilizations. Essentially, they hoard failure, broken empires, and the wreckage of mortal accomplishments, often corroded and oxidized into rusting, crumbling heaps of once highly valuable or even priceless relics, and now putrid heaps of slag melting together through its, through this creature's vitriolic breath are the furniture of its home. The black dragon's acidic breath attack forms a long stream of acid. A newborn black dragon's corrosive breath can burn through 5d8 damage worth of material, growing stronger over the years to deal three times that damage to anyone caught in the 10 foot wide wave that an ancient dragon can spew forth. Due to its choice of habitat, black dragons can breathe both air and water and are very accomplished swimmers. The inhabitants of the swamps with an affinity for cold and a venomous nature tend to worship black dragons, especially the lizard folk and kobolds, but neither one of these two are considered welcome by the draconic sovereign. In fact, if a black dragon detects any creature other than its own kind within range of its lair, it can make a lair action on initiative count 20 to dissuade unwelcome visitors. The black dragon can cause a surge of water anywhere that it can see within 120 feet of it to reach out and grasp any creatures within 20 feet of the pool who have to pass a strength saving throw, otherwise they're pulled towards the water. Using its insidious and blighted nature, this creature can send out a swarm of wriggling, horrible, biting insects. This absolutely massive cloud which distracts players with a legion of stings and bites for 3d6 piercing damage, or the dragon can simply cover their environment in a plume of darkness, shrouding all those who rely on sight 
to be at a massive disadvantage. Weirdly though, of all the dragons, despite being the most ferocious and the most aggressive, the most hostile, black dragons are actually the species which is least attached to its treasure hoard. It both hates and fears other dragons, regardless of whether they're metallic or chromatic, and if one approaches it that it deems too strong, if one moves into a nearby neighbourhood, if a black dragon's lair seems to kind of encroach on the edges of another dragon's habitat, a black dragon will absolutely unequivocally abandon all of its historical treasure and flee without any conflict. On the opposite side of that scale though, blue dragons place immense value on their treasure hoards. And as well they should. A blue dragon is obsessed with magic and therefore cultivates any item that stores latent magical energy, particularly magic items and gemstones. And of those gemstones, they are particularly interested in sapphires whose blue tones appeal to the dragon's massive vanity. As the most proficient of all dragon kind in their study of the arcane magics, blue dragons attract followers who wish to learn from them, like scholars, wizards, sages, but also bards and assassins sometimes, perhaps attracted by their long lives and their knowledge, or perhaps by the massive wealth and glittering treasure that they manage to accrue. And a blue dragon gains strength from such refined acolytes who massage their enormous egos with their admiration. Blue dragons dragons cannot suffer even the slightest insult or insinuation of their potential weakness or inferiority, and therefore craft elaborate, ornate homes, not unlike a temple or a castle, with themselves as the figure of veneration at its very core. They make their lairs in arid and scorching deserts, using their ability to burrow and tunnel through the ground, to glide as easily through the deserts and dunes as they do through the air. The abrasive sand, just like a pumice stone also polishes a blue dragon scales to a near mirror shine, making them difficult to spot at a distance, especially when they're flying overhead in a clear blue sky, unless their rage invokes a terrible thunderstorm or their radiant lightning breath marks them out against the black and tumultuous clouds that form atop their lairs. Blue dragons actually feed in more verdant areas than those that they make their home, capturing livestock from more luscious areas, and they're not always in a rush to eat their prey. Sometimes they might bring back handfuls of animals to their lairs where they'll wait for one of their followers with great culinary proficiency to season their meal and serve it to them as a banquet-like offering. Green dragons are the most deceptive and manipulative of the chromatic dragons, and with their affinity for forests, they are the personification of the feeling of becoming lost in the deep and ancient woods, scared and alone. If you think of the kind of Blair Witch or the Ritual movie, you're approaching this cunning creature's kind of atmosphere. Counter to its cousin in the black dragon, green dragons are actually fascinated by living things. And rather than markers of mortal failure, a green dragon's horde is actually made up of popular heroes, perhaps of bards, or people that a bard might tell a story of. And they also accrue representations of these people's accomplishments and deeds. A green dragon believes that by imprisoning these people, not only is it superior to them by besting the most famous beings that they can learn about, but also that their deeds and accomplishments become the dragon's own accomplishments, as they own the creatures that they are attributed to. They commandeer other people's successes, quelling escape attempts and uprisings of these famous and powerful people by constantly poisoning their captives with a constant stream of a weak version of their toxic breath. These creatures actually play with the minds of their victims. A full blast of their cone of poisonous breath is just as deadly as other dragons' attacks, although many more creatures seem to be immune or resistant to poison damage than other types of damage. This is definitely no reason to take a green dragon lightly. A conflict with one may result in utter madness or perhaps imprisonment for the rest of your your days if it deems you worthy. In fact, the idea that a creature may underestimate them is one of their most frequently utilized tactics. They'll often pretend to fall in combat, be captured or wounded, only to wait for their victim to lead them to one of their homes, let their guard down, 
Trojan horse style take them back as a captive to wherever they make their home, their impregnable castles, their opulent palaces, and so on. And only then, when victory is absolutely assured and all potential strategies have been thoroughly thought through, will a green dragon rise and strike to devastating effect. More often than not, a green dragon will construct an elaborate forest lair thick with labyrinthine mazes of perhaps trees and thorny hedges to separate and terrorize wandering groups of adventurers, picking individual off one by one, but not before they've terrified and manipulated each one with their greatest fears through hallucinogenic toxins that it gently breathes as settling mists of toxic breath from above. If one adventurer shows particular promise or celebrity, a green dragon may bring it to the absolute brink of sanity before offering its life and perhaps its greatest desires in exchange for its willing enslavement and service to the great green beast. Adventurers wandering into a green dragon's lair will likely find long lost famous heroes willing to fight them to the death, having been promised their freedom if they succeed in killing any intruders. But this is almost always a hollow promise on behalf of the green dragon. Red dragons are the archetypal chromatic dragons, who draw inspiration most closely from Smaug in The Hobbit, being the most avarice and greedy of the chromatic dragons. Red dragons make their homes deep within volcanic mountains of any environment, bathing in the lava within, as no heat is too strong to damage a red dragon. Rather, they are the commanders of flame, with their iconic cone of fire breath, which, when they're fully grown, can deal an eye-watering 26 d six damage in a 90 foot cone. Red dragons are tyrants whose arrogance and pomposity is absolutely unrivaled. As such, they hoard gold and other forms of wealth in absolute abundance and are well known to take over drow or most likely dwarven castles in the deep molten places of the earth, as only an ornate and beautifully crafted kingdom is valuable enough to match the red dragon's splendor. Now, although they're fiercely territorial, they can't resist hearing how the outside world views them. They're so incredibly vain that they have to hear stories about themselves. They despise being left out of the loop and adore hearing tales of people fearing them and their exploits. So they'll gather followers, worshippers and messengers to continuously inform them and wreak havoc on their behalf to hear tales of their destructive reputation and of those of their followers. In some cases, they've been known to usurp whole kingdoms and force the inhabitants to serve them as a new king or queen so that they have a ready population to torture and subjugate in exchange for admiration and notoriety. White dragons have absolutely no purpose for illustrious kingdoms and masses of followers. They are the last of the original chromatic dragons and are the most animalistic and bestial of the chromatic dragons. They're the most savage and least intelligent of their kin. However, their feral behavior actually makes them the most effective hunters of all chromatic dragons. They are potentially the most deadly. They dwell in the frigid wastes and fjords surrounded by hordes of frozen and ancient bones, shipwrecked vessels, the treasure that legions of pirates may have once carried across the frozen oceans, the great tusks of ivory from mammoths long since extinct. In their frozen kingdoms, they are the apex predators, unrivaled in their slaughtering potential and ferocity, unburdened by the intelligence and egos of their cousins or the need to cause elaborate drawn-out suffering in their foes. White dragons prefer to freeze their prey solid with a cone of of icy breath and then simply devour all of their restrained prey. Their attacks are swift, instinctively calculated and devastating. Unlike the bravado of their cousins, you may never see a white dragon coming. It may burrow up from the ice, freeze an entire party solid and kill them before they have a chance to react. Interestingly, despite their comparatively low intelligence, white dragons actually have a perfect memory and can remember every single moment of their lives as if the events had transpired only moments ago, even if they occurred actually thousands of years prior. As such, if they're defeated or perhaps offended in another way, they will engage in elaborate vendettas to obtain vengeance against their foes, a battle they will usually succeed in winning because they can always reliably memorize every single technique, skill, move, or spell that, that an opponent used against them last time they fought. The only downside of this incredible memory is that pain, wounds, mental suffering, and other anguish that they endure is just
just as fresh to them as it was the moment that it occurred, which makes them constantly furious and vengeful beasts. They're often sought out and worshipped by historians and scholars, because their perfect memories make them receptacles of untold knowledge, but all a white dragon sees is additional food. Now, my patrons actually voted not for any of the original chromatic dragons. Today I gave them an option of every single type of chromatic dragon available, or at least chromatic dragons that I'm aware of. I know brown dragons and things like that also exist, I don't think I, I put that on the voting list, but the type of dragon that I'm drawing today is a purple dragon, because by following the basic principles of colour theory, we can tell that there are some shades of dragons missing from the lineup that we have in 5th edition, and from those that were introduced in 1st edition's initial release. We have the primary colours of blue and red, but we're missing yellow, and in terms of tertiary colours, we have green from the mixture of yellow and blue, but no orange or purple. Well, for my birthday this year, all the way back in May, my wife found me a collection of dragon magazines, including issue 65, which was published in 1982, which has an article by Alan Lloyd entitled The Missing Dragons, which cover this exact issue. Alan Lloyd mentions that Tiamat, the mother of all evil dragons, is believed to spawn chromatic dragons, and she claims claims that she is the progenitor of all of these creatures. For example, she would quite happily tell you, if you were to survive an encounter with her and have a conversation with her, that she produced every single dragon that you will ever encounter as long as they are chromatic. But that's not at all true. She may just like the sound of that, because chromatic dragons have also been known to reproduce with each other, with other members of their own species. But Alan Lloyd puts forward that perhaps the mating pairs of dragons could be a union of two different chromatic dragons, and although this is incredibly unlikely, because because they're so self-involved, they believe that only other members of their particular colour are worthy of them. If this unlikely event did occur, that they bred with another chromatic dragon of a different type, this would cause an unbelievably rare hybrid of the two species. He goes on to say that the innovation and inventions of curious wizards could also be responsible for these strange unions, but however this occurs, whether grown in a sorcerer's lab from a test tube or between two equally evil star-crossed lovers, he's given us some rules for the missing chromatic dragons, which I've actually adapted for 5th edition as homebrew creatures, which, if you're interested in seeing them, can be found in my website under the homebrew tab, which I'll leave in the description box below. And these extra dragons are totally free of charge, you don't need to be a patron, despite my patrons voting on seeing a purple dragon today. Now, as I've mentioned, my patrons get to vote on all of the monsters that you see each week. I take suggestions from your comments down below, or however you wish to com contact me, which I add to a massive to-draw list. And then that list is something that I give to my patrons every Every single month, and they vote for their favourite ones, whether they tip me the price of a cup of tea every month, all the way up to the very, very highest levels. So they are responsible for all the different kinds of dragons that you're going to see this month, and actually for every single Monster Monday that you see, they pick from your suggestions. So if you'd like to help to support the channel in a very, very personal way, if you'd like to help me make these videos every single week for you, I can't do it without your help, so I really, really appreciate your support. But you also get to have more control over what you see from me, you get to pick things like this. If you want to see a purple dragon, you get a purple dragon, and I like to give other rewards as well to my patrons at various different levels. So that can be anything from a shout out on all my social media, a copy of every single illustration that I do each month, including all of these that I'm doing for Dragon December. There's private live streams, and also, at the highest level, we get to have a one-on-one -on -one chat where I can help with your adventures, help you design dragons of your own, help you talk through your ideas for characters, I can do some drawing for you and stuff like that, or we can just chill out and chat. So if you'd like the sound of any of those things, then I'd urge you to head over to Patreon, because your support is what allows me to do this, and this is an absolute dream for me. So thank you very, very much if you choose to do that. But as I say, you don't need to be a patron to get access to these homebrew dragons. They're just on my website and in the description box, so look out for the link there. Now, purple dragons are said to be the strongest of the three chromatic dragons that are missing from our original lineup, and are born of the union of red and blue dragons. Now, unfortunately, in these Dragon Magazine articles, their personality isn't really spoken about in the article. But with one parent, that is a red dragon, and one that's blue, what we can absolutely guarantee of these things is that they are incredibly narcissistic. It'll likely hoard treasure of high magical value, so perhaps only magic items, or perhaps maybe only gemstones actually, if a red dragon likes wealth and a blue dragon collects gemstones as well, so it has to be closer to the raw financial value that a red dragon covets. They like to dwell in very, very dark places where their breath weapon will be most effective, but they don't actually have a temperature preference. Their breath weapon is detailed in this article, and it's a fusion of lightning and fire, which Alan Lloyd calls a beam of energy, which is as long as a lightning bolt from a blue dragon, but with the heat of a red dragon's fire breath. And that says to me, you could call it force power, 
power, perhaps, you know, force type damage if you want to, but I like the idea of calling this radiant damage and perhaps making this a radioactive type element. So honestly, playing with these themes, I feel like a purple dragon would seek out to subjugate most likely the drow or perhaps other illustrious and grand subterranean civilizations who dwell in utter darkness, choosing to avoid those illuminated by extremely deep caverns filled with lava or magma, so the brightness of their radiant breath is most effective. As well as being a huge beam of energy, Alan Lloyd makes serious note of the fact that the blindingness of their vision is something that they like to utilize a lot, blindingness of their breath. I see them massaging their egos with a legion of drow or a lithid hostages who are threatened with constant blindness if they rise up, or perhaps simply disintegration if they cause a threat, and a great purple beast who, in its rarity, only magnifies its egocentricity. I see its lair as a radioactive hellscape, where the denizens of a once proud city are promised cures for their radiation poisoning in exchange for servitude. A very, very bleak fate indeed. Perhaps those who worship this dragon like a cult see their mutations and cancerous growths as blessings from the dragon, and those that die and succumb to the radioactive poisoning are just those who didn't worship hard enough. I'll talk about yellow and orange dragons a bit more in their own videos. I have those coming up on a couple of Fridays during Dragon December. But briefly, yellow dragons are said to be the long-forgotten parents of the far more notable green dragon species after mating with blue dragons. Alan Lloyd reasons that yellow dragons are likely to dwell by seashores the high salt content, where, like their green offspring, their coloration would allow them to camouflage if needed and swim just as well as them. They're likely to be smaller than the blue dragons and less intelligent, and they're likely only so scarcely seen because their habitats are so limited by comparison to their green spawn or their blue partners. They only really like the coast. Their breath is a cone of sodium chloride, which is table salt to you and I, and according to Lloyd, its absolute causticness is so strong that it blinds and causes clouds of chlorine to poison affected targets and burn their skin for acid damage. Additionally, sodium chloride is known to rapidly accelerate the rusting process of iron and other ferrous metals, something which I definitely take account of in my homebrew. I treat them very much like rust monsters, but with a breath attack. As for their hordes, perhaps they, like green dragons, like to capture story-worthy or famous things, and due to their environments, are obsessed with perhaps pirate treasure or shipwrecked galleons and orange dragons are the fusion of yellow and red dragons dwelling in rivers and lakes, making their lairs in cave networks filled with water, perhaps those made of limestone, which is a very, very porous stone, with plenty of jagged stalactites. They produce a constant stream of oil and mucus from their mouths that looks like a thick, viscous saliva, which is gross as hell, but protects them and their insides from their own breath attack, which is heavily dependent on a violent chemical reaction. Alan Lloyd says that these creatures fire a long stream of liquid sodium with as much force and as power as a sandblaster or a power hose. This silvery liquid reacts violently when exposed to air and essentially combusts into a stream of napalm, a burning linear torrent, and reacts even more violently when exposed to water, which is why they live so close to lakes, where it erupts into giant explosive fireballs if it can spit this liquid anywhere near water. Interestingly enough, something that I'll talk a bit more about on their own specific video, because of this reactiveness, pouring water over someone who is engulfed in the flame of the breath of one of these creatures makes things ten times worse, and only dowsing a fire with oil in this circumstance will put out these terrible chemical fires. My goodness, that was a long one. As I say, there was so, so much to cover with Chromatic Dragons. I could make a video about each individual one, but with this being the first Dragon December, I wanted to cover the broad spectrum of Chromatic Dragons. Maybe I'll go into more depth next year. But thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for joining me in the first video of Dragon December. Thank you for joining me for this Monster Monday. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed seeing me finally, finally, finally draw a dragon after all of your wonderful suggestions. I had absolutely tons of fun. There was so much to research here, and there's so much more to talk about with dragons, so I hope you'll join me next week where I talk about metallic dragons as my next Monster Monday. Even this Friday coming up you should see a video where I go into a bit more depth about orange dragons so I hope you'll join me there as well. If you enjoyed the video please make sure to let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by leaving me a little thumbs up, perhaps favourite this video and share it with any communities you might be a part of. We're only little dragon wormlings ourselves so anything you do like that really really helps this channel to grow and I really really appreciate your support and help in that way. So thank you so much for joining me and until next time 
time. If you see a dragon, always make sure to take note of the colour of its scales, because if it's chromatic, you might have a wildly different encounter in store for you if you're expecting just a fire-breathing, flying murder tank. Always stay prepared, and until next week, happy monster hunting.